call the meeting to order. Is it on? Call the meeting to order. One more time. We'd like to call the meeting to order. Yeah. I think that's next week's agenda. And the first order of business is an election of the budget committee chair and vice chair. Yes. Chair, I'd like to uh, nominate Dennis Hidgmans for chair. Oh, nice. Is there a second? I'll second that. Vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Did I do that wrong? No, it's perfect. <laughs> I didn't get to hand it over to Dennis. Yeah, Dennis, would you like to take it from here? Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, I'd like to open up the nominations for vice chair. And as Shauna was vice chair last year, I'd like to ask if you'd like to stay on. Sure. Okay. Well, you have a second. I'll second that. Okay. Any other nominations? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor of Shauna remaining as vice chair, signal by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Sympathies to us both. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. okay. Dennis, you might want to pull your mic a little closer to you. Okay. Um, committee business, I think we have minutes to approve, right? So. Where did those go? We have to approve the minutes of our last meeting, Tuesday, May 13th, 2004. 14. 2014, sorry. <laughs> um, any corrections, notations? I would entertain a motion to approve as written. Uh, so moved. Second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Tuesday, May 13th, 2014. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. Minutes are approved. Other committee business? No other committee business? Anybody on the committee wish to make any opening statements, say welcome back or the like? Okay. Then we'll move into public works. Uh, wrong agenda. Orange. No. Are you on the fifth? I think the agenda is seventh. seventh. Put your message. Okay. That's why we're not on the schedule here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we reelect the chair. Um, <laughs> Let's just stick with one thing at a time. Okay. <laughs> Item number three, the budget message. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the budget committee. My name is Steve Mokarhyski. I'm the Lane County Administrator, and uh, I have uh, had pleads for brevity. Can you hear me okay? Uh, Give that a tap and see if that's it's on, but okay. can we turn it up a little? Okay. Okay. How about if I speak really loud? Sounds good. If you, and just let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the Budget Committee. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. One year ago today, I began my service with Lane County. I took this job not because I thought the work would be easy, but rather because I believed then what I believe today, that we have an opportunity to do something special, to work together, to solve challenges, and make this organization and community the best that it can be. I understand what you all understand, that the decisions made in Washington, D.C., the steep reductions, uh, in federal forest payments have been and continue to be out of our control. 
We all understand the significant cuts to services that have occurred over many years and the limited local resources that exist to fund local services. In fact, Wayne County collects the second lowest local revenue of any county in the state. And you see this chart here that illustrates this point. Uh, people have asked why do we collect the second lowest uh, local revenue of any county when you pile up 36 counties in the state and we're the second lowest, why is that? Well, because historically we've had federal forest payments into the general fund and the road fund that funded local services, but we've seen over a 70% decline in federal forest payments since 2008. And uh, despite the fact that we are the second largest metro area uh, in the state and the fourth largest population, we're still uh, the second lowest collector of local revenue per capita of any county in the state. We also understand our strengths. We have a board that rolls up its sleeves to solve challenges. We have a dedicated team of leaders throughout the organization who work hard every day and a concerned public that is willing to thoughtfully engage in reasonable solutions. As I traveled throughout Wayne County during the past year and I found this out myself, it actually takes a year to get all the way around Wayne County. Uh, and as I've traveled around Lane County with our commissioners and with our staff, and as we've had conversations with residents, I've heard a consistent message. Our residents want openness, they want accountability, and long-term stability. And we spent the past year working on those goals and laying the foundation necessary to create long-term stability. When we focused on solutions that we control over the past year and in prior years, we've been successful. Most recently, we've had a strong focus on investing in a high quality workforce. We have a balanced and diverse team, many of whom, uh, all of whom you see here, um, and many others who are not in this room. Uh, some of those folks represent new blood to the organization and some have been with our organization doing great work for years. We have outstanding employees throughout our organization who work under great pressure to provide exceptional services with declining resources. We're committed to fostering an environment of continuous improvement that allows our employees to thrive. And in the next year, we will launch three new programs that support employee development and ingenuity in Lane County, including a new performance management system, a learning management system, and continuous improvements program. We're striving to be open and accountable. We've reached out to residents throughout Lane County in new and innovative ways. We know that we make responsible use of limited taxpayer resources. Our AA3 bond rating, which is the fourth highest bond rating provided by Moody's, is an indicator of that. Our low risk auditee status since 2009 is a reflection of that. And the jail levy audit that was recently completed that uh, determined that the resources collected from the public safety levy approved in 2013 were spent as the county said they would be spent. All of these things are illustrations of our quality financial management. So despite the fact that we have fewer resources than we need, we do believe that we're responsibly managing the resources we collect. We're also pursuing long range planning. We have a new strategic plan, a new 10 year public safety plan. I'll hold these up. This is our one page of strategic plan. This is our 13 page strategic plan that the board with a, a significant detail. Our 10 year public safety plan as we committed to uh, at the end of last year's budget cycle, we're doing quarterly financial reports uh, for our Board of Commissioners and quarterly updates on our strategic plan. And these documents aren't documents that just sit on the shelves. They're living, breathing documents that we're using to focus our limited resources and limited staff on the areas that are the highest priority for the Board of Commissioners and for our community. And we're focused on three priorities as part of our strategic plan, a safe and healthy county, vibrant communities, and infrastructure, and we want to be the best. We know we don't have as much money as we feel we need to provide the level of services that our community deserves uh, and would like to see, but it doesn't mean that we can't strive to be the best. And we're continuing to collaborate with partners. Lane County has, I think, a proud history of working together uh, with its 12 cities and with others in the community to partner uh, and in the last year on issues such as revitalizing our local economy, reducing poverty and homelessness, uh, and seeking a regional solution to fund road safety and maintenance. These are all things that we're doing to partner with others in our community. So our approach in developing this budget 
reflects what we know and what we've heard from our residents. We need to achieve long-term stability by focusing on local control. The actions that we take today will set the stage for future stability. The challenges we face have not been created overnight and they're not going to be solved overnight, but we can set in motion actions that will put us on a course towards long-term stability. And there are three primary strategies that we focused on in achieving long-term stability in the budget that we propose to you tonight. First, we must continue to reduce our ongoing expenses. We propose a significant change to the way that we fund and structure our employee health insurance by moving from a fixed premium with a private insurance carrier to a self-funded employer model where we pay the claims as they're presented to us. We anticipate that this new plan will reduce budgeted health insurance expenses by approximately $2 million next year. Our employees will experience no changes or disruption in services. And in fact, approximately 61% of private sector employees are covered under similar plans. The benefits of a self-funded plan include reduced costs from not paying fully insured carrier profit margins, added flexibility, and increased control. While this plan may be bold, it is a responsible step in stabilizing our long-term health insurance costs by gaining greater control locally of our claims. This is just the first step in this strategy. This change sets the stage for additional cost controls such as preventative care, regular audits, and ongoing discussions with employees about the design of our plans. We've also analyzed other ongoing internal costs such as our unemployment rates, and we propose reductions that match our long-term experiences with those costs. The second strategy as much as possible is to use one-time resources to fund one-time expenses. The federal Secure Rural Schools payments in the road fund and in the general fund have decreased by over 70%, and they're becoming increasingly uncertain. And you see that again in this chart here. We propose to invest a significant portion of the 2014 and 2015 SRS payments to pre-fund existing debt obligations, both in the general fund and the road fund. So we propose those revenues that come into those funds, stay in those funds, but pay off existing debt. This debt reduction strategy shrinks our ongoing obligations for those costs and those funds. It frees up resources to fund services over the long term, and it creates long-term, uh, it begins to create long-term financial stability. And the third strategy is one that we're engaged in currently, a conversation with our residents and voters about the level of local revenue needed to invest in critical local services. So together, these three strategies provide a balanced approach to create the long-term stability that we seek. We have focused our efforts on these three strategies before we contemplated any reduction to services. We wanted to make sure that we left no stone unturned to preserve as much of our critical services as possible. As a result of these efforts, the fiscal year 15-16 proposed general fund budget is balanced without reductions to services, thereby achieving a key board priority by maintaining existing public safety services. The repair of our underfunded public safety system will continue as we collaborate with our partner agencies through the Public Safety Coordinating Council to leverage additional state resources to fund critical public safety services. We've also been able to continue general fund support for important health and human service. The size of the annual structural deficit in the road fund due to steep declines in federal forest payments has forced reductions to critical services. Thankfully, as a result of our health insurance and other expense savings, as well as our debt reduction strategy, we were able to maintain several priority services that would have otherwise been reduced. In the reductions that remain in the proposed road fund budget, we've made every effort to maintain as many critical road and bridge services as possible. After several years of reducing staff by 35% and spending down 50% of reserves in the road fund, however, avoiding impacts to critical services is simply not possible. The proposed road fund budget reduces positions, materials, and contracts with local vendors. Paving repair, chip seals, slurry seals, overlay projects, striping, vegetation management, roadside mowing, 
dust abatement, and bridge repairs are all reduced to bring the budget into balance. The challenges in the road fund are not new. The board and the budget committee have discussed the structural deficit in the road fund in numerous public meetings over the past several years. And as you know, the board has asked voters to consider a new $35 per year vehicle registration fee on the May ballot. The fee would generate approximately $6.5 million per year for Lane County that would be restricted to maintain safe roads and bridges. If approved by voters, the fee would also provide additional funds for each city in Lane County to use on road work. It's important to note that no additional revenue from the proposed fee has been assumed in the proposed road fund budget. We've had some questions about that. This is a responsible approach, we believe, and it's consistent with how the county handled the fiscal year 13-14 proposed general fund budget before the public safety levy was approved by voters. We can't count on resources that we can't count for sure. Uh, we wouldn't do it in our personal budgets, and we sure are not going to recommend that we do it with the taxpayers' resources. The decision now rests with our voters. Uh, the Budget Committee meets shortly after the May 19th election, which provides the committee an opportunity to restore critical road and bridge, uh, road and bridge safety and maintenance services if the fee passes. So as we look to the future, uh, uncertainty remains in areas outside of our control, and it always will. We don't know what the future holds for federal secure rural schools payments. We don't know what the future holds with state regulations and state funding. We don't know the full extent of the impacts from the Supreme Court decision on PERS, although we're analyzing that and we will be prepared uh, for those impacts when they come. And we don't know the impacts of many other issues. Uh, we will analyze and plan for the impacts uh, that are outside of our control, but we will focus on solving challenges locally in our organization and in our community. And I want to uh, just thank a few people. Thanks uh, to our outstanding budget team uh, and our department staff who are here who put in a lot of work behind the scenes to put together a proposed budget. And we, of course, have a lot of work left to do. But I want to uh, give a, a special thanks to all the staff that do really the, uh, the important work behind the scenes. Thanks to the budget committee, particularly our citizen members who volunteer your time to come uh, and give uh, an outside perspective into the inner workings of uh, the resources that we collect and spend for important public services. And a thanks to our partners, our cities. You notice maybe these new signs that we put up as a symbolic gesture of the fact that we have 12 different incorporated cities, many communities throughout Lane County, but we're committed to working together to solve challenges. To private businesses, community-based organizations, and others that we work with on important partnerships. And thanks finally to our residents for engaging with us in important discussions about how to solve our community's challenges. So we look forward to a thoughtful and productive budget process over the next several weeks, and we look to the future determined to focus on to focus on balanced solutions, greater local control, and long-term stability. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Uh, thank you very much. One of the exciting things in this proposed budget is the idea that the uh, county's um, insurance uh, health um, to the uh, 1,300 employees would be handled differently than in the past. And I understand that one of the ways to minimize the risk of taking that over uh, and not having a, a private insurance company relationship is to have something called stop loss insurance. Um, it sort of caps the amount of money that we would have to pay in the event of an unfortunate and expensive claim. How does that work, and how much money does that cost? Um, I think I'll ask either Christine or Mary Miller, who's here, to, if you'd like to take up that discussion now. Uh, you're correct, Commissioner Sorensen, that one of the uh, we have a number of ways in which we're planning to mitigate the risk that the county takes on by moving to a self. Uh, funded health insurance plan. Uh, one of those is to purchase stop-loss insurance, which would cover 
high cost claims and other claims, and Ms. Miller can detail that as well as what the projected cost would be. We factored all the costs for insurance for we're still going to need to contract with a third party administrator to administer our claims. And it's our plan is, please go ahead. Our plan is to contract with our current health insurance provider so that there's no disruption in services for employees there. I would also note that we have a health insurance reserve that is in place that will also provide some risk mitigation in the event that any of our costs go above what we've budgeted. All right. Mary Miller, Benefits and Wellness Manager for Lane County. Commissioner Sorensen, you had asked about the cost of the stop loss insurance. We estimate the cost will be in the neighborhood of $1.6 million. And what that does is puts limits on our individual claims, which are considered the specific, and it also puts an aggregate limit on our entire claims cost to protect the county's assets. Thanks. I have a question. That microphone is clearly not working. Are we being televised? Is that an issue? Do we need to deal with that? Perhaps use the table? She said they're being able to hear. They are able to hear. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Can I have another question? No. No, of course you may. I'm interested in knowing at the beginning of this budget season what some of the challenges you're likely to face a year from now, and that would give us some context for the rest of this year's budget. It looks like about a 1% growth in expenditures and a 1% growth in revenue, setting aside the road fund issue. But a year from now, what are we looking at? Sure. And Ms. Moody will detail this for you. In the general fund, the challenges in the general fund in fiscal year 16-17 and fiscal year 17-18 are much greater than they were for next year. We faced a shortfall in the general fund of nearly $2 million. In fiscal year 16-17, I believe the number is around $7.5 million. And so we are not going to wait. You know, our view is that we don't wait for January to have our leadership team meeting and then propose what the shortfall is going to be, and then we start fixing it. We're doing things today that we're proposing this budget that, again, we believe will set in motion long-term expense reductions as well as revenue enhancements if those are approved. So there are a number of things that we're looking at doing. We'll talk more through this process about the health insurance cost control efforts. I mean, I mentioned the investments in wellness, the dependent audits that we're doing to make sure that we're insuring people who are eligible to be insured, but we're not insuring people who aren't eligible to be insured. So there are a number of things that we're trying to do around that. But this is we're going to be actively involved, and we already are today, in analyzing what challenges we face in future years and beginning to set in motion actions that will reduce our imbalances in the future. And, again, our real focus is to try to impact the structural deficits, both in the road fund and in the general fund. We are using some one-time money, so let's be clear about that. But what we're trying to do is say let's start using one-time money to invest in one-time expenses and try to begin to create that long-term stability. Okay. I have one question. Go ahead. So I wanted to compliment you on the new changes in the health insurance. I think that's fantastic. As a citizen member, I was really pleased to see some fresh thought process and looking to address that significant expense because it is so high. I'm wondering if you could give me your opinion about progress towards having some of the county employees make payments towards their own premiums and your thoughts on the Cadillac tax and how that will also impact the county going forward. Those are good questions, Mr. Chair. We had meetings. We shared with the board earlier today that we had meetings with all seven of our bargaining units last week to share with them much of the information we shared in the budget message. 
um, and and particularly to talk about changes uh, for uh, that impact employees. We're making a number of investments. So you, you heard, and we'll talk more about the detail of these programs: a new performance management program, new learning management program, things that are investments in employee development that are really positive. So we wanted to talk about those. But the big, in the long term. Uh, one of our long-term strategies really is going to be to work on uh, this $25 million cost that is our health insurance countywide. Uh, that is that is the budgeted cost approximately for health insurance. So we, we laid these things out. We think that, that uh, I should say, um, several years ago, Lane County moved from seven health insurance plans down to the current two. So that was an important step that happened several years ago that the board supported, that employees that were, ne were negotiated with employees. That was a big, a big move. We think the next big move is moving to a self-funded plan to get greater control of those claims, and then to start making investments, do the dependent audits so we know who we're insuring, make investments in wellness, um, and then, after we've done all of these things, uh, sit down with our employees. And that's an issue that we're going to have to discuss at the bargaining table. Uh, and talk about how we can come up with some reasonable solutions to try to get uh, the, the costs in line. The Cadillac tax um, is a significant concern that we have that we will be impacted by in 2018. There are some local governments that you can, you'll hear from our staff who's going to conferences and they engage with peers around the country and some local governments are saying, we're just going to wait. Well, we'll see what happens in 2018 and then we'll open contracts then. We're not taking that approach. We're saying, no, we need to start working on this today. Let's start putting actions in motion, again, consistent with everything that we're doing here, that will start addressing uh, those issues uh, today. And what we don't want to do is have to write a check to the federal government right. in a penalty, uh, which are resources we could much better utilize uh, funding services in our local community. So that those are conversations that uh, need to happen through the defined process that we have for bargaining with our employee groups, and we will do that. But there is a sequence here. So again, I think that move from seven to down to two plans a few years ago was really important, and we saw stabilization uh, of costs, even though health insurance costs have grown. This next move hopefully will create additional stabilization, and then these these additional things that we're going to do uh, will be really critical. So uh, there's a process involved there. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, my question was asked. Thank you for asking that. Okay. Yes. I'll just add also and to just thank the administrator for all the all the work and, and congratulations on your one year. Um, and thank you for your one year and sticking around. Um, and I just wanted to comment from the conversation we had earlier just um, how how great it is that in addition to bringing costs down with the self-administered plan, the um, some of the employee wellness programs and initiatives, I think you are going to share a little more about those later. Um, how great that is that that's part of the part of the plan, and for the county as an employer and as an institution to um, to model that and to provide that for employees, and that there's a lot of benefits and sort of longer term to do some of that sh short term investing in in staff um, for that long term pay off um, both to the bottom line for the county and for the health of the employees and the wellness of our community. So I really appreciate those components as well. Going once, going twice. Okay. Christine, item four, budget overview. Now that I'm on the right agenda. All right. There you are. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Hitchmans. Can you hear me well enough? We have been told that we they can hear fine on the television. So but if you can't hear me well enough, I can always sit down if those mics are better for in the room. What do you think? Or if that mic is better. Is that better? <laughs> I'm getting blank looks. I can't even tell if you can hear me. Hello? Is that not right any better? Yeah. Is it fine? You have right up to it. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Wish I could pull it up. Okay, I will do my best here and just signal me to speak up if I need to. All right, so um, I'm here to present the overview of the budget. So I'll start with some um, high level uh, over all funds and then drill down a little bit on the general fund and then you'll hear about the road fund um, after me from Tanya Heaton with Public Works. 
Um, so first we want to start, even though this might be repetitive for those of you who have been on the committee or um, on the board for many years, um, some budget basics um, to explain why we put our budget together the way that we do. Um, we do have a local Oregon budget law that dictates the way that the budget is put together, um, how we budget by fund. Um, so that is the first level that we budget at, fund, which is a fiscal accounting entity. And so you can find all of our funds back in the appendix and you'll see them mentioned throughout your document, um, but you can see them all on one um, sheet and showing you the increases, decreases there. Um, the fund types are also defined in budget law. They're general fund, uh, special revenue funds. We have many special revenue funds. Debt service funds, which are used strictly to receive and then pay out for debt payments. Um, capital fund. Enterprise funds, which work more like a business, you'll see that with uh, solid waste, land management, um, where they have fee revenue that's uh, covering all of their expenses. Then our internal service funds and then fiduciary fund. So below the fund, we then budget by organizational unit, which for Lane County is our departments. And then one tab that you'll see in your document referred to as general expense, which is general expense consists of some items that don't aren't appropriate to go in one department. They're more countywide, so that's why you'll find those there. So then after the organizational unit, we go down to the account classifications. Um, so at the back of every department section, you will see every account, revenue, and expense used in that uh, department's budget. And then in the back of the document, you'll also see it by all funds rolled together, every account, and then a general fund section. So there is a difference. Um, between revenue and resources. And you'll see both of those terms throughout your document. Um, revenue, meaning property tax, non-property tax is the way budget law um, defines it, but non-property tax being everything else, grants, federal revenue, fees, licenses, um, things that continue every year that we could count on um, kind of like a salary for a household. Resources could also include our fund balance carry forward, um, any one-time transfers that might be coming in, one-time money is more where you'll see those resources. So revenue is part of the resources. On the other side of the equation, we have expenditures and then requirements is the bottom line. So expenses are, again, those ongoing expenses, uh, personnel, material and services, capital, our debt service, and then when you add in um, expenditures such as transfers and our reserves, uh, unappropriate ending fund balance, if that exists, then that gets you to the total of the requirements. So in order to have a balanced budget, we obviously need resources to equal requirements. So then to go how our budget looks for 15-16 versus the current year. So our current fiscal year 14-15 modified budget is about 544 million. Proposed budget in front of you is 550 million. So that is an increase of 5.8 million. I will note that that increase is largely a result of the secure rural schools coming in in mid-April, um, which amounted to about 15 million between the two payments because we're getting a 14-15 payment and a 15-16 payment. Um, and then FTE is decreasing by about 35. That is the decrease that you'll hear more specifics on uh, in public works as a result of the road fund decrease. There's a couple temp positions, temporary positions that were um, slated to go away. Um, you'll see those in assessment and taxation. They were project related. And then we have the movement of both workforce partnership and kids first are leaving the county effective July 1st. So the FTE that were in those functions is also obviously gone from the budget. And you'll hear more about kids first when the district attorney presents. So revenue versus resources, to go back to that um, distinction between those two, um, our revenue total in the budget is 350 million. As I said, the resource, the grand total budget is about 550 million. So the difference there is the beginning fund balance in all county funds amounts to about 164, 165 million. And then the fund transfers is the other piece that's gonna show you the difference between those two. And on the expenditure side, 368 million is our ongoing expenses, um, 550 million the total requirements again, difference again being uh, fund transfers and the contingency reserves. Now one thing I'll point out to you, going back to the slide before, beginning fund balance, 164 million, reserves which would 
uh, potentially be your ending fund balance, 147 million. So that shows the spending of many times one-time money. Um, it could be one-time project money, that then the expenses will go away also. But that number getting smaller over the year um, shows that we're spending down our reserves. So budget by fund type. So the majority of county funds are spent in specific ways designated by law. So as you can see on the graph there, the special revenue is the bar to the left. So that is by far our largest type of funding in the county budget. And special revenue has specific rules attached to about how it can be spent. Um, examples are gas tax, um, road fund, video lottery, our enterprise funds where the proceeds are needed to provide that service. So uh, the third bar over is the general fund. Uh, again, on the revenue versus resources, property tax versus non-property tax. Uh, our property tax rate being so low, this shows the bar to the uh, left is our property tax total versus all of the rest of our revenue. So very small percentage there. And then as far as where the property tax is coming into the budget, the majority of it in the general fund. There's a little bit that comes into the school fund, which is actually in lieu of taxes, but it's classified as property tax. And then our local local option levy that has about just over 15 million. One thing you will notice in your document that I um, described at orientation for the budget committee is that the juvenile justice center bond was paid off in 1415. So if you look at property tax year to year, it's going to look like it's staying very flat or maybe even dipping down, but that's because that property tax levy is gone along with the expense because the bond is paid off. So property tax is actually growing at about the 3% statutory limitation. So we do continue to have the same um, issues with our property tax, though. Um, the rate of the tax being very low, as you heard from our county administrator, um, one of the lowest. Um, I know that the chart um, that most of the budget committee is familiar with back in our appendix that shows all of the 36 counties and the tax rates comparison, um, that is in there for you. Again, we are still down near the bottom. Uh, one thing I will note is that chart is um, 13, 14, I believe. So it's not showing our levy quite yet based on the tax years. So next year it will show that. We have to wait for the Oregon Department of Revenue to have the most recent information out there. Um, but the growth of the tax is also a problem with property tax, that we have that 3% cap unless there's the new construction. So we're right about 3% now, according to the assessor's um, forecasts. Um, but that, as you'll see, expenses grow at a rate faster than that. So just showing you the revenue types within, this is all funds again. Um, there is, it's pretty steady in those four areas except for federal revenue. And you'll see it's going up because of that two-year extension um, that was just approved in April, mid-April. Other than that, we're about stable in the types. Revenue comparison, um, showing that our budget is more reliant on state revenue now than it is on either property taxes or federal revenue, whereas um, decades ago, federal revenue was far and away the greatest. Um, so it just shows that shift down in that revenue source. And again, you've already seen one graph, but I'll show it to you in a different way, uh, the federal revenue. So over uh, 100 years of history here with the contract um, about sharing the timber revenues um, and the last 20 years being more volatile, um, frequent budget cuts. Um, since 2007 is what the graph is there, shows you that payments to Lane County have decreased over 70%. And that graph just shows you road fund and general fund. We also get money into the school fund, which just passes through the county, and then we also have some Title III fund, um, but that shows that drop there and the amounts that will drop to in the 15-16 numbers. So county expenditures for all funds by type of expenditure. Um, obviously, we have a lot of uh, services that are just that, services that are provided rather than a product. So personnel services is up there with 28%. Uh, material and services, then 33%. Um, we do have capital expenditures of 3%, debt service being very low at 2%. 
Um, and then fiscal transactions, which includes the reserves for the most part and the transfers that you'll see there. And reserves overall of all funds, about 27%. Just some increases, decreases for you of all funds. Personnel uh, going up 1.3%, whereas material and services is going down 3%. Uh, capital projects, which is very cyclical, so you will see that kind of go up and down over the years, but for 15-16, it will go down 15.7%. Debt service is stable, um, and I say stable plus the prepayment of some debt is included in the budget, which will detail for you a little more. I'll talk about the general fund piece, and then you'll hear more from Tanya on the road fund piece, um, and the proposal to use that one-time secure rural schools to prepay some of our debt in order to free up some operating money. Um, reserves going up about 5.68% and a, a, a bit of that also being related to the secure rural schools coming in late and that's why that's uh, going up there. So expenditures as a whole, um, revenue continuing to grow fairly slowly. Um, in many areas of the forecast, I'm forecasting way below 3%, which is what we can do on property tax, but most of our revenues are growing closer to 1, 1.5% and sometimes decreasing. Um, so expenditures continue to grow at a faster rate than our revenue, which in increases the need for local control. So as you've already heard, um, a couple things that we did with this 15-16 budget was the self-funding of health insurance. So going from the premium to paying for claims um, makes a big difference in cash flow, especially in the first year where we won't start paying out um, right away. We'll wait for those claim uh, payment requests to come into us. And we'll eliminate overhead and administrative costs by doing that. There's more flexibility with benefit design and there's no disruption in services or claims administration. It's seamless to the um, employees and the participants. So unemployment rate and reserve, that was also mentioned. Um, unemployment rates as a whole, as you probably know in our local economy, have been stable or decreasing. Um, so our reserve had been built up in anticipation of reductions with the secure rural school payments going away. Um, so we found that our claims uh, coming in are not as high as we um, had anticipated, and so we're able to decrease that rate that's charged out to departments. That's an internal charge because we're completely self-funded. Um, and that was increased claims management from legal counsel, lowering our liability and cost. And then, of course, expenditures, uh, material and services, um, utilities going up, gas and oil, insurance, which is general liability line in your budget. Um, those items continue to rise um, with experience or the marketplace. So just to touch on reserves, as I've pointed out, our amount of our reserves, um, why to have them, um, why it is fiscally responsible to have reserves and the level. Um, so we use them to pay obligations prior to receiving revenue. In the general fund, we don't receive property tax until November, December time frame. So we have to have cash flow at the beginning of the year to be able to pay the bills for the general fund. Um, so as we've gotten our reserve closer to 10%, we're definitely getting closer and closer to November, we watch that cash flow happening. So it's important to have that. Um, it's also important to have a, uh, for the bond rating agencies, they grade our financial health based on our level of reserve. They consider 10% for the general fund to actually be on the low side. They'd rather see about 15%, but because we've managed our resources um, so well, they continue to, as has been mentioned, keep our bond rating high. Um, we do have financial policies that dictate the amount of the reserve. Um, it's to be at least 5% in all funds except the general fund, which is 10%. You'll see many of our funds are higher than that, and again, it's the cash flow item. So parks is an example where their strong season is the summer. They can't have nothing in the bank on July 1st. They have to have cash to go through as they collect their revenue, um, and you'll see that in other funds too. So we say at least 5%, but many of them need more than that. Um, and they can address that for you when they present if you have questions on that. And then we use reserves as a planning tool. Over the fat, uh, past 15 years in particular, the Board of Commissioners has used reserves to keep service levels stable for as long as possible. So while that's very good for services, it's not sustainable um, because it's one-time money. So it is why you hear us talk about deficits in the future unless there's a replacement of those revenue sources. 
So recent changes, you've already heard us mention Secure Rural Schools, um, which was authorized, uh, reauthorized in mid-April for two years, including the current year at a step-down rate, so 95% and then down to 95% again. Um, that provides funding into the county budget in the road fund, the general fund, Title III fund, and I already mentioned the school fund, although I don't list it there. Title III fund will provide funding into land management where we have a FireWise program that gives grants to homeowners um, to fireproof um, much of their landscape housing, that type of thing. So then we also have HERS. So just last week, um, many of you would have heard that there was a lawsuit, Supreme Court ruled on a recent lawsuit. Um, so that was more versus the state of Oregon. So I just thought I would briefly, very briefly, talk about what that was. So there were two issues. Um, there was an income tax credit for out of state um, that was challenged. Um, if you continue to live in the state of Oregon, you pay income taxes on your PERS. The legislature had given a type of a credit to those individuals. And if you moved out of state, you were still receiving that credit. So the lawsuit was to end, or I'm sorry, not the lawsuit. The original legislative changes was to end that credit. Um, that was upheld. But then there were also COLA changes um, where there was a step down of COLA based on how much a retiree was making. Um, and a majority of that was overturned. So that was the largest savings for the PERS system. And you might remember a couple years ago, our PERS rates decreased after budget adoption. And that was a result of that legislation going through after adoption and our rates changing. Um, so um, employer rates have already been set for the 15-16 budget and the 16-17 budget. The state and PERS set them on a biennium basis. So we do not expect any changes to the PERS rates for 15-16 or 16-17. The first time they would change would be the 17-19 biennium, which would be the fiscal year 17-18. So the Oregon uh, Legislative Fiscal Office last October had put out a memo talking about the estimated impact if the entire changes were overturned. Um, their estimate at that time was about 5.5% increase in rates. Now, because we still have two years to wait, we don't know that that will hold, and the entire case was not overturned. So that's really a worst-case scenario, most likely. Um, but that would be up to about 500000 budgeted um, increase for the county based on current budget. So however, Lane County, as you also might remember, has a PERS reserve. When those rates decreased after budget adoption, Lane County, like many local governments, said we're a little worried about some of these legislative changes. We're going to reserve some of these rates going forward, and we did that for a year. So we do have a reserve um, that can be used to offset those increases. So just to let you know, no immediate impact. So to touch on the general fund budget. General fund budget is staying very stable, again, because we got that secure rural schools budget. So the size of the budget is only changing by about 400,000. Um, general fund FTE is decreasing by 18, however. Um, that is because of a planned shift of FTE and jail beds to the levy. Now you may remember two years ago when we passed the levy, we knew that general fund was decreasing over time as we forecasted out. So the levy was uh, projected to gradually pick up more of that expense over the five year time frame. Now because we've received more general fund than we thought we would with the extensions of secure rural schools since the levy passed, um, this is the first year that we're shifting some of it additionally to the levy. So we're still providing more general fund to the jail than we had projected we would be able to, which is good news um, for the jail service. Um, so that decreases there's about 14 FTE shifting because of that. And then there's some temporary assessment and taxation positions going away. So that's the 18th you're going to see. So discretionary general fund. Um, that is unrestricted revenue within the general fund that either has no strings attached to it, meaning it's not specific grant, um, doesn't have uh, rules from the federal government or grantors, um, or it's not received as a result of direct service. So what I mean by that is an example would be the um, sheriff's office providing a service of concealed handgun permits. The revenue that comes into their department would not be considered discretionary general fund. It would be only the revenue coming directly into general expense, things like property taxes and the timber money. So discretionary budget has actually gone up for 
1516. Um, that in large part is this Curral Schools renewal and carry forward of the larger um, than 10% reserve. Lapse is what we refer to it as departments spend less than their budget. <coughs> so the discretionary general fund by revenue source is majority made up of taxes and assessments general, uh, in the general fund again. So all of the revenue about 26%. The ONC timber payment revenue now makes up only about 4% of discretionary general fund. And beginning fund balance for 15-16 is at 17%, state revenue being 10%. So where to find out more about general fund services? Uh, LaneCounty.org forward slash budget. Everything that the committee sees is posted online um, by date so that anyone um, following the budget process can find that information. Right now it includes the proposed budget document that each of you have and then also the service option sheets that are found in your binders. Um, the service option sheets provide information on every discretionary general fund dollar that's being spent and accounts for that shows you uh, the mandates that the county has to follow, the level of service leverage um, generated by those dollars. So uh, back to the recent changes in the Secure Rural Schools. I mentioned the prepayment of debt that's being proposed. In the general fund, um, we have um, a debt referred to as heirs. It was a uh, part of a public safety communication system. We bonded that debt. Um, we still have several years, on, more than several years on that debt, probably about 10 years to pay off the debt. But there is a piece of it that is callable, meaning it can be prepaid um, in 2019. So we are proposing um, that the funds from the Secure Will Schools as one-time money be used to pay that debt payment for the next few years and then pay off the callable portion in 2019. So that amount there shows you the first box, shows you the uh, cash savings not discounted by paying that off early, about 363000 The other savings, of course, is that you free up that debt payment, um, which is about 162000 a year, so that it can be used for operations. Um, we also have, those of you on the committee for a few years might remember, there's a state court payment owed. Um, it was a... Uh, court assessment fee that we need to pay them into their security fund. Um, it's a five-year payment, $245,000 a year. 15-16 will be the second year, so we would be able to pay that amount off also, the $980,000, which will free up the operating money of two hundred and forty-five. dollars It won't be going to that payment. It can be used for ongoing expenses. So the annual debt payment decrease would be about just over $400,000 for the general fund. So looking ahead, this has already been mentioned, the um, forecast and the deficits for the future. Um, the proposed budget still does not equal stable funding after 15-16. Uh, still contains uh, one-time resources, fund balance carrying forward. Um, as I mentioned, the fund balance in the general fund about $15.5 million at the beginning of the year, whereas our ending fund balance will be about 8.4. So that is the spending of one-time money. So summary of the forecast, um, the general fund will continue to experience deficit projections in the coming years. 16-17, um, uh, beginning fund balance will be much smaller as we've spent it in 15-16. Um, so that will be the need to reduce services unless the revenue source is um, replaced. 17 and 18, then we deal with the structural deficit um, and a few smaller revenue adjustments. So here's a graph for you and the amounts that have been mentioned. So 1617 estimated deficit as of today is about seven and a half million. Um, 1718 would be 2.1 million. And then going forward, you're dealing with the structural deficit, which is between one and one and a half million. So these have already been mentioned also, but financial health of the county, despite the bad news of deficits coming, um, we do continue to have strong financial policies. Our debt levels low and even decreasing under the proposed budget. Um, we have a good bond rating, and then also the low risk oddity designation from our external auditors. And that is all. I'm open for questions. Questions? I answered them all. Huh? Yeah, can, we, 
jump back to the uh, general fund projection that you have with the, <coughs> that graph, yeah, and walk through that again because I'm not quite. It looks like there's much more of a gap in the out years than 2.1 million to, to one to one and a half million going forward. It's compounding, which is a okay. different way than you've seen the graph in the past. We kind of. Right. It depends on some people are used to see it compounding and then the amount. So this the graph assumes that the deficit is not fixed in 16, 17. But of course, you would have to have a balanced budget. OK, I get what you're saying. Right. I, yeah. I so it can, just itself. showing that it continues to grow over time. I went by it fast enough that I didn't quite Sorry. catch that. So yes. I wanted to make sure I understood the graph. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. OK. I'm surprised. No questions. <laughs> okay. Thank right. you, Christine. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but let's go to uh, item, also item four, and do road fund financial overview. Time for the road show. Yeah. Time for the road show. Excuse me. Time for the road show. Yes. How's that? Yeah. Better? <laughs> Hello, uh, Terry Hitchmans and members of the Budget Committee. Thank you. I'm Marcia Miller, the Public Works Director, and I have with me today Tony Heaton, our Budget Manager, Financial Manager. And I'm going to provide a brief um, overview of the road fund. Um, and where we are, what the status is, and then Tanya is going to do the financial summary. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> our goal in the road fund is a safe regional road system. If you look at this road in the picture, what a safe regional road system looks like is clear pavement, smooth pavement, good delineation of lines and striping, and as you can see here, a lack of any vegetation, good clearances. We currently have in Lane County a $6 billion asset. And um, I just want to say for those of you who may have attended the many community meetings, a lot of this will be familiar territory for you tonight. But um, the $6 million asset is over 400 bridges, 1,440 miles of roads, and those are miles of roads. Some counties refer to roads as, um, as lane miles. If we were talking about lane miles, that would be double. And 22,000 signs. As you've heard several times tonight already, we've seen a pretty severe <coughs> decline in federal forest payments to the road fund, a 70% reduction since 07, 08, at which time it was about $22 million. And in 1516, it's only 6.4 million dollars. The funding issue. The, there are two primary sources of the road fund. One is the highway fund and the other is the secure rural schools or the federal forest payments. As you can see by this graph, from 03 down to 1516, we've seen a continuous decline in secure rural schools or the federal money. We've actually seen a bit of an increase in the highway fund, but as you can see from the graph, it's not really enough to close the gap. What makes up the State Highway Fund? The State Highway Fund is made up of a, of a number of components. One, fuel tax at 47 percent, a weight mile tax of 25 percent, and registration fees of 21 percent. So over the years, that excess, the um, expenses exceeded revenues by $9 million with that drop in secure rule schools funding. Federal forest payments reduced and expenses in increased to leave us with a $9 million gap. This is a number that you've heard actually for a number of years um, that was coming this year. So we've taken a number of correction actions over the years. We've reduced employees by 35% since 2000. We've reduced reserves by 50% since 2000. We've consolidated and reorganized services for efficiency. We've used innovative technologies to lower costs, 
and we, aggress we aggressively sought grants and partnerships to leverage our resources. However, even with all these corrective actions, we need to replace our revenue, and we've reached a critical level, which is sometimes called a tipping point. Pay now or pay much later. If you've driven on Lane County roads, you know that our roads are in very good condition. And they're in good condition because we have, we have applied the least costly method of maintaining our roads. And people will often say, why are you fixing that road? It's perfectly good when we're doing a slurry seal or a chip seal project. It's because we can spend a dollar now to avoid spending about $12 later if we have to reconstruct that road. Once a road starts cracking or alligatoring, then the substructure is gone and it costs a lot more money. And of course, you can see that all around the city of Eugene with their summer construction projects now. So what did we do? <clears throat> Public Works staff worked closely with the Roads Advisory Committee and researched a number of potential revenue options. We took those options to the board and the board asked us to take them back to the Roads Advisory Committee and research them and vet them further. The Roads Advisory Committee unanimously recommended a local vehicle registration fee to the Board of County Commissioners. And the board unanimously approved that for the May ballot. Why a vehicle registration fee? First off, it's a regional solution to a regional issue. 40% of the money collected goes to the cities to help pay for their maintenance costs. It's also directed to road use only by the Oregon Constitution. And there's an efficiency of administration. There's already a program in place. The Department of, Env of Motor Vehicles already collects registration fees. We've estimated it would cost about $80,000 for them to collect about $11 million in annual revenue. And then again, over $11 million generated annually. What was recommended to the Board of Commissioners? A $35 annual registration fee for passenger vehicles, trailers, and trucks under 26,000 pounds. $20 for motorcycles, and a $10 one time for heavy trailers that also pay a weight mile tax. The board could have imposed it. They chose to send it to the voters. The vehicle registration fee is on the May 19th ballot. And as Steve mentioned in his presentation, the proposed budget does not include the new fee. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tanya for the financial summary. I always get the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> she gets the tough part. Can everybody hear me? i to eat the mic, Tanya. <laughs> Eat the mic. Okay. How about now? <laughs> okay. So you've seen this chart uh, for about seven years where we've talked about we're going to have a $9 million gap. When we started talking about it, we thought it, it would, we would get there in three to four years. But through the management uh, of staff and leaders and employees, we've been able to stretch that out just as far as we could. And the, the time has come. That, that we're just there and we don't have enough uh, stretch anymore. Um, the differences that you see up there between 1415 and 1516, the gap, the biggest difference is the transfer to the sheriff's office. I want to be real clear that in 1516, the sheriff's office funding for patrol is coming from the general fund not the road fund. So that's a major difference here, and it changes our gap from the over 11 million down to 9.5. The other thing that you're going to, to see up there is a difference in 16, 17. You'll look at the capital expense and see that the capital expense in 15, 16 is over 5 million, and in 16, 7, it's 3.6. In 15-16, we have grants and reimbursements for some capital projects. We don't currently have any of those scheduled or contracted in 16-17. So both the revenue and the expense goes down, but the gap stays pretty flat. So here's the gap, same line that was at the bottom of the previous chart. 
And the next thing we did was look at reductions. County admin and human resources and uh, the benefits managers, they all helped get uh, cost savings for the entire county. The road fund share of that is 265 265,000 for 1516. I've carried that out with a 2% growth over the years, figuring that the savings will continue to stay there. Obviously, that's not enough to get that gap. So then the road fund took 5.5 in reductions. These are services, and I'll go over those with you in just a minute. So in preparing the proposed budget, we took 5.5 in reductions. This all brings it down, brings it down to a $3.6 million gap, even after the reductions. Those reductions include 24 hours, uh, seven day a week, ice and snow response. So what this means is we no longer have enough staff to last for a seven day event. We probably don't have enough to do, run 24 hours. So what you'll probably see is you'll see some immediate response and then you'll see maybe four or five hours where we can't cover the response and then they start back to work again because we don't have enough road maintenance employees to run 24 seven. You'll see reductions, excuse me, you'll see reductions in vegetation and guardrail, road work supplies, this will affect our local suppliers. So we get a lot of our rock and a lot of our oil from local vendors, local companies. That's going to be reduced significantly. The same thing is happening in maintenance and preservation where we contract out work. The majority of those contracts go to local companies and those will also be reduced. Project preparedness, we have fewer people, so it's going to take longer to get the projects ready. Project management, we have fewer people, so we won't necessarily have as many inspectors on the job for as many hours. We'll reduce one waymaster. We will likely have reduced storm response. That means if you live on one of those streets where all the trees come down, we'll have to prioritize which roads we go to first. So the rural, rural roads that are the farthest out that have maybe one or two houses will probably be farther along days before they get cleared. We're going to reduce by 18 FTE, which is an 11% reduction in the road fund. I see a lot of concern looks. Do you want to go over this some before we go to the next slide? No? Nope. Okay. So then what we did, remember we have the $3.6 million gap. So as uh, managers, we started looking for one-time revenues and we found three. We're going to uh, take a, a refund from our fleet replacement that we have acquired over time through savings of holding our equipment longer and uh, maybe purchasing at a different price than was estimated, but all through savings over the last four, five, ten years. So we'll be taking a refund from our replacement program for our vehicles and equipment. We have a FEMA reimbursement that we got this year that came in later this year after we'd already expended the money to, uh, for those services from the last few storm events. So we put that in the reserves in 1415. We're going to spend it in 1516. The other one we have is we're going to re reduce reserves by $1.8 million. And that got us to zero. The next thing that happened was we got news that the Secure Rules Schools was approved for two years. So in talking with the, uh, Steve Mokerheisky, we uh, followed his uh, direction and we put that in the reserves for 1415. Then in 1516, we're going to spend half of it 
on a combination of things. The majority of it is going to debt service payment, but we use 600,000 of it to buy back some services, and those are seasonal uh, road maintenance workers. We're going to do the same thing the next year. So basically, we aren't spending any more than 600000 on operations. The rest of it went to the one-time debt service. Our base budget, our reductions, our one-time monies, our balanced budget. So we've used extensive one-time monies. We're balanced. We've lost a lot of services. And this is where we're at today. We have an option out there. If, we, if the local revenue option is approved by voters, we'll be able to buy back 3.1 in services for 15.60. Now, the reason this is different is because we figure it will take some time to get the processes going. So just because the voters uh, approve it in May, we don't actually start collecting it until January, right? in January, and then the money will take a couple months to get to us just because of processing and collection and all of that. So we only plan on, if it's approved, spending $3.1 million of it in 15-16, just because of timing. These are the services that we propose to buy back with that $3.1 million. 13 FTE, road work supplies, Maintenance and preservation contracts, project preparedness and management, mowing, striping, guardrail, chip sill, paving repairs, reinstate the Waymaster, storm and ice and snow response back to 24-7 capability, dust oil program reinstated. The engineering and road maintenance folks have gotten together and they estimate that that the difference will be in the project and miles and quantity of work you see up there. So chip seal will go from 46 to 67. Roadside mowing will go from 1,800 to 2,400. Paving repair, this is in tons, it's materials, will go from between 5 and 7, 75 to 11 to 12 that thousand tons. Striping miles will increase to 49. Dust abatement was, has been at zero for the last few years. will go to 20 miles. Guardrail vegetation maintenance will double. Fish culvert projects will be out, able to add three. Gravel road maintenance 158 miles. Overlay projects will be increased by almost two miles. Slurry seals will increase by eight and a half. Bridge repair projects uh, from two to four. And the Waymaster position will go from one to two positions. That's what we've got for the financial situation. Marcia's got a couple more slides. No? Questions. Just questions. Go ahead. On the Waymaster uh, position, is there anything like an industry standard for the amount of trucks or the amount of tonnage or the number of miles uh, that um, one Waymaster can keep an eye on? Or is there, is there any way of knowing whether having two people doing that job is is four times more than we need or one-tenth of what we should have? No such thing. We're, we're not aware of it, and we haven't done that. There's no research. state mandate uh, on any particular level of uh, protection for the public on on this? Not that I'm aware of. Many so we, counties we in, in Oregon, um, it's a choice. 
many, many counties in the state have and in other states. It's, it's, it's a choice. Um, we've been down to two for four years, five or six. Sheriff. Sheriff's office. When did we go to two waymasters? 2012. So. So what's the high number that we've had in the past? Well, when there was timber. Yeah. Well, I don't know what the high number was there, six, but six. but probably at least six to eight when there was uh -huh. timber. Yeah. But that. Is there any correlation between having waymasters and having lower costs associated with roads because people are going to follow the weight limits and not pound up the roads as much? I would say You're yes, but let me ask the engineer. For a waymaster here. Okay, uh, Bill Morgan, the county engineer. Um, as you well know, when you have a large overweight truck, it impacts uh, through their, through their uh, axles the structure of the road. And we have a $6 billion asset, 1,400 miles of roads. So in theory, if you let those uh, loads go unchecked, we're going to get a lot quicker damage to those roads. So I think personally for a county this uh, large, at least one or two waymasters would be a minimum. Is there some kind of industry standard that the county uh, uh, engineers throughout Oregon or the West use to say you can spend less on your roads if you have some waymasters out there making sure that people follow the rules? We would be happy to research that and bring it back to the committee. I think that one thing the budget committee might think about are some of these um, structural kind of problems in the budget and, and seeing if we can find some sort of industry standard for something like uh, our public works department in terms of waste management, in terms of roads, and maybe even over into the social uh, services. Um, you know, how many public health nurses do you need to avoid having some big outbreak of of uh, communicable diseases like we saw last last uh, winter in um, Lane County? In other words, uh, see if we can get to some um, some um, numbers, metrics, measurements, and compare them to other other um, uh, governments. Mm -hmm. and see if their outcomes are any different. Because I think there's a, uh, a reason that they put me over here on the left side of the table with Dennis, because we both, right, we're both on the left side. No, wait. I'm on your side. Oh, are we on the right side or the left side? Anyway, <laughs> the reason we're over here is because we're interested in the cost effectiveness of these. And I think if you could make an argument for um, a third position or a fourth position and say, gee, you know, really it does make sense. The people that are, that are following the law, the people that are not uh, overloading those trucks, that are not damaging those roads, and I might add, increasing the uh, severity of, of accidents when they do occur. So there's a, there's, a, there's a benefit to the public separate from the benefit to the government in maintaining the road. So I would just love to see that kind of thing in the budget. I don't know if there's a place for it. I don't know if Mr. Mokraheisi could issue some sort of edict to have a better budget. Um, maybe that's too complicated and maybe it couldn't be done anyway, but I would just encourage uh, both the committee and you to think of reasons why these expenditures are in the public interest and why they really save money. And it's, a, it's an example where we're trying to invest early on. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Tanya, can you? Back up to the slide where you talk about how you dealt with the SRS payments in the budget. Great. I, I want to make sure I understand what the slide's telling me in some ways. Okay. Um, because there were some budget gaps, but I'm seeing down at the bottom the net SRS payment. And I guess that's kind of taking the, 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 in the, FY 16, 17, the forecast years out there, 
So do you want me to to kind of walk you through? Yeah, kind of walk okay. you through that because when you when you get to the next the slide where you talk about the balanced budget, I wasn't quite following what the projected gaps were for the out years due okay. to the SRS payments. These two that we that the one time re up that we kind of got this this year. So okay. I want to make sure I understand. So a, a few years back, uh, discussions with Secure World Schools and the. Um, ability to time when they came in and how much they came in at. It, it was decided at either the board or the county administration level that we would get them in in one year and we would spend them the next year once we knew exactly how much we got. So the 14-15 payment up there comes in in 14-15 and goes into the reserve. It's not spent in 14-15. You know, by the time we get it, you know, they say the end of May. Okay, well, by the end of May, we might get it in June, um, depending on who's processing it and, and all of that. So then in 1516, the one time SRS payment of 2.9 is half of the 5.9 that is received in 1415. 2.3 of that is spent on debt service reduction, and 600 is spent on restoring services. The money received in 15-16, the 5.7, is the additional amount because we already have timber in the budget. Right. So then that 5.7 is split in half in 16-17, and spent for 2.6 goes to debt. Now in this year, we get a credit back because we don't have to pay that annual debt payment because we've now paid it in full. And we have 612,000 in restored services. So the net that goes to operations is zero. So in the, the second half of the SRS payment, is it split? Is that going into reserve? Yes. Yes. Which I know we've drawn our road fund reserves down to ridiculously low levels, so I understand that. Okay, so if you advance a slide or two where you get to your balancing the budget and your projected deficits. So line 12, net SRS payment, is the zero so we're net. still forecasting in 16 17 about a 3.8 million dollar deficit yes and and 17 18 another 4.8 that's not cumulative that's for that's just not that cumulative year. yes and then then six that's six that, I can't. that jumps and um is that eight okay in 18 19 it's 5.4 Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm having trouble reading that digit over there. My glasses aren't First helping numbers me. Five. Yeah. Five point four. Okay. So, so even with the SRS payments and all that, we're still looking out there at some pretty significant operating deficits in the road fund. Y yes, uh, as long as we uh, utilize it in, in the way that the county administrator has recommended, we've used that those payments for debt services. What is the projected reserve in the in the road fund at the end of um, FY um, sixteen? So I guess it'd be no fifteen sixteen. That when we put these half payments away, in the two half payments away. Right. I'm going to check my number Our, here. Um, at at the end of 1516, it's currently uh, projected to be 21 million. And that's with the SRS. With the SRS in it. So 21 million dollars in reserve for a six billion dollar asset. Yes. And at that point, it will include about six million dollars of SRS at the end of 1516. Yep. And that's not only the five percent. Um, prudent person reserve 
that's also all the reserve we have for if we have a bridge fail um, prematurely or you know a major section of roadway you know washed down a hillside that's all we've got really there to fix that, Is that that's correct and we we keep we try to keep at least a 15% reserve because of cash flow. Remember that the majority of our uh, preservation and improvement work is done during dry, warm months, and we have to have enough cash on June 1st to fund those because those aren't necessarily big revenue months. And, and we need that cash so that we can pay those contracts and buy those large amounts of supplies and have them on hand and use them from May through October. So we have to have some cash flow also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, can you go back to the slide that shows the uh, service reductions? Yes. I think it's really important that we dwell on this slide for a little bit so that it kind of sinks in what the service reductions mean. We went through it and kind of glossed over. We went through it very quickly. And, uh, you know, we, we talked about the Waymaster a little bit and industry standards. We don't need to know what industry standards are, but the fact is uh, truck drivers love it when we don't have Waymasters. Yes. Uh, because they uh, they don't have to be concerned, or they have to be far less concerned about whether or not they overload. So it's not a it's a very disproportionate amount that trucks are overloaded uh, when we don't have waymasters. You know, I drive back uh, down Highway 58 quite regularly, and we see the empty scale, the unoperated scales there. I drive on Clear Lake, Clear Lake Road regularly and see the unoperated scales there. And needless to say, our waymasters have a different technology. You know, they they carry their scales with them. Right. Get people in place. So truckers have uh, drivers have a less uh, less easy of a time skipping uh, skipping by the waymaster. Mm -hmm. But we uh, directly and and once again disproportionately increase the the uh, opportunity of catching drivers who are most importantly unsafely operating an overloaded vehicle. You know whether or not they're uh, affecting the roads. Uh, that's you know that's not killing people and that's not harming people. Um, but uh, by having the mobile waymasters, if we increase it from one to two, then we uh, we uh, catch a lot more truckers uh, who are who are ten tending to overload because we, they don't know where we're going to catch them. They, they you know they can skip scare up the clear like road pretty easily, drive around the scales there, but they can't drive around a waymaster who's on the road. So um, when it comes time to actually talking about the numbers in this budget, I for one I'm going to be talking about the waymaster and the uh, um, the leverage that adding waymasters give us in making the roads a safer place to operate. Uh, safe, safe place to drive. But as we go, as we look back up through this list of service reductions, now some of the things uh, have a very real impact on people's everyday lives. Uh, if we look at um, uh, the 24/7 uh, ice and snow response, you know we expect our roads to be cleared very quickly after the tree goes down. And Tanya, I, I always love the slides that you show us. I wish you'd sl show us some of the slides of uh, roads that uh, roads gone bad. You know? I'll, I'll try to bring some Thursday. Well, we'll bring <laughs> pictures Thursday. It's always a highlight of my present your presentation, so it's, it's They a, wanted to change this year. <laughs> they don't have to change every single time. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> so the um, but if we look at uh, the fourth bullet point down, now the importance of that one right there, maintenance and preservation slash local contracts, let's consider that as an economic impact to the kingdom. Yes. Much of our slurry sealing and much of our chip sealing is done by, the, the product is made by local contractors. Correct. The, uh, the work is done in large part by local contractors, uh, not entirely, but in large part. And so when we reduce that number right there, we don't just reduce the uh, the impact on the longevity of the road, but we, it's a, it has an economic Im impact. People aren't working when that number is reduced. That's correct. I, I wanted to point that out, that this is this slide right here, while well, we've glossed over it pretty quickly, the impact of each one of those bullet points goes far beyond just a line item on the budget. It affects people's every everyday life. And some of those items have a, uh, once again, a disproportionate uh, positive effect when we increase them. Having one waymaster in a county the size of Connecticut, uh, as efficient as he is, 
You know, it's uh, it. Uh, I, I think you get far more than double the value or double the effect when you add one more waymaster. If you have two waymasters, and the same when you have three. Uh, so it's uh, we, when we get to the point where we're actually weighing this this budget, and uh, uh, this will be after May 18. And, mm -hmm. uh, and a chance to kind of look at uh, what, you know, where are the important elements, where do we need to place the money that is more or less discretionary. I want to come back and look at this slide right here, here because this is huge. Uh, okay. This is uh, this carries a lot more impact than just a line item on the budget. It, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to step in for just a second, and obviously we're starting to hear some real interest in Waymaster and the potential for reduction of road damage and other attributes that, that they could bring. So um, that we, you've had a lot thrown at you tonight, perhaps a day or two or three, um, to research it and get back to the committee might be a very wise idea. Yeah. I don't know if we'll have enough time to research it and prepare our slides for Thursday, but we can certainly, uh, if I can't find the research tomorrow, we can certainly bring it back to you next Tuesday if that's okay with county administration. Well, I would certainly say by the either the beginning of our last meeting or the end of the second to the last meeting gives you all the time that we could possibly give you, and I, and I sense think that this is becoming an important subject for the group. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Lincoln. Thank you. Um, so keep staying on that slide. Mm -hmm. So the second to the last storm response, and uh, memory serves me correct, we went through a couple floods over in Mapleton. Yes. Public Works is right there cleaning up. Mm -hmm. uh, about a year and a half ago or so, we had a we got to 10 below zero in an ice storm. I remember talking to some folks who were in the private timberland business, and it's, uh, he, they basically told me it looked like an earthquake went through. Right. And I think a lot of us probably had trees and branches fall down in our yard. So on storm response, <clears throat> if we, for a couple things, vehicle registration fee doesn't pass, the legislature still is decided they're going to, you know, play like children and not pass the transportation comprehensive tra transportation package. I'm assuming that this means that you will pick and choose on what kind of storm response public works will have that maybe some outlier uh, roads. I'm sorry, we'll get to them when we get to them. Is that is that kind of what you're looking at as potential here? Yeah, it it means it doesn't mean that we won't be doing any storm response, but it does mean that we will have to prioritize. Right. Like you said, the um, heavier trafficked roads will be the ones that we'll have to get to, and the other ones it will take a while. Like for instance, Deerhorn, you were able to get to this year. That may be on the uh, list. Is we'll we'll get to them when we get to it. Mm -hmm. Well, Deerhorn is pretty heavily traveled. It's pretty heavily yeah, traveled, but still it's not a major uh, county highway where right. you're getting from one community to another. Or jobs are trying to, people are trying to get to their jobs in one community to another. I'm just, right. you know, and I know it's fairly heavily traveled. Mm -hmm. I've, yeah. I've played that golf course before. And we did, as you know, recently have a major slide on Deerhorn that we're able to we get did. to really quickly. Very quickly. I was actually very impressive. So that's, uh, I think that's very key. And I think, again, again, you know, it's been pointed out many times when you're in a county of this, our size, and um, you know the the major part of the population lives in the central area, but you still have to get to folks because their jobs are required to travel roads to get mm -hmm. to that central area for employment. So, all right, very good. Thank you, Shana. Thank you. I have a couple of specific questions on your department requirement summary. Is that something that you, we can discuss now, or would you rather I had submit it in writing and you can get back to it? Out of the budget book? Out of the budget book, yes. I did not bring that with me. If you tell me what your question is, I can come back with that information on Thursday. Okay, great. So I have three. Okay. Um, some of them are rather small I, dollar amounts, but when we're talking about a reduction in services, I think every dollar matters. Can, can you wait just a minute? Do you want her to write them down and submit them? Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll be brief. How okay. about that? We'll bullet point it. So my first question, I was surprised that the budgeted cost for banking and armored car services more than doubles. 
I have the answer to that. Okay. We plan to inst uh, institute and implement uh, credit cards at waste management, solid waste management. So I believe the summary that you are looking at is for the entire department. Mm -hmm. And so the credit card fees will increase significantly when we start taking them at waste management. Currently, you can only do cash or check at waste management. Are you planning to increase the services to offset the merchant services fees? Um, we are not increase the services or the fees. We're increasing the fees. Yes. We recently awesome. increased the fee already, and so I do not believe that we are going to increase it for 1516. We'll probably come back at the end of a large assessment that they're doing over their operations and come back with proposals in the fall ready for next budget uh, process. So it will be for the 1617. Are you anticipating increased usage of waste management out of these places if, once you offer credit cards? No, we're not anticipating increased usage. What we're actually anticipating is uh, some people, a lot of people will use them at the transfer sites, but the other thing is, is we have a large amount of accounts receivable, oh. and we're going to be encouraging those people to use their own cards rather than have accounts receivable. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so two more. Okay. Um, the outside education and travel expense budgeted for roughly 150000 I was looking and that looks to be about double of what was actual expenses in the 12 and 13 budget year. So I was just wondering, you know, why this significant increase over a short period of time when money is so tight? I'll have to look into that one. Okay, final one. I said I had three. Mm -hmm. And then also in the public, public works budget, the line item for vehicles. So the current budget has 388000 slated for vehicles, and that's increasing to 934000 roughly in the proposed budget. As a capital purchase? Yes, as a capital outlay, so that's already budgeted and not something that can be adjusted. It, it certainly can be a, a adjusted, but what happens is all of our vehicles are in a replacement program, mm -hmm. and they're slated to be replaced at the end of their life. So you'll see that number go up and down depending on what years we buy them okay. and, and when they're due. And I'm just hearing from Howard that says that we're going to buy a large compactor in 16, 17. So th those are uh, very expensive. Yes. And the compactors are for waste management. Also for waste they're almost a million dollars total. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? No. Okay. Um, is my understanding correct that we have to wait till 7:30 for public comment? We, can we start early? Okay, then let's take a break till 7:25. You take whoever's here. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. We have a break on the agenda, so I say let's do it. Take it now till 7:25 and start public hearing at 725. You're the chair. Did that? You're the boss. Okay. <laughs> you the <demand>. man. <laughs>
Before we get going, I had a couple audience members tell me it's really hard to hear us unless we get right up to the microphones. Okay. Um, we have three people that have signed up to speak. Um, and that and first up would be uh, Janice Howard, followed by Diane Oak Silverman, <coughs> and followed by Kit. I won't try to butcher your last name. So, welcome, Janice. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Janice Howard. I appreciate it. It's been a long day for all of you, so I do appreciate this opportunity. I'm a constituent of Faye Stewart, who was kind enough to give us a meeting uh, with one of my associates. We're here to talk about um, getting a public animal shelter. My professional training is in the helping professions, but I'm speaking to you this evening as a longtime volunteer of Green Hill Humane Society and the First Avenue Shelter. Another longtime volunteer and I have attended and testified at the Lane County Animal Services Advisory Board meetings and the Eugene City Continuous Improvement Program, CIP, and Budget Committee meetings. We also have taken a number of meetings with various county commissioners and city councilors to discuss the urgent need for a, a new public shelter to house the county stray and homeless pets. Everyone we have met with is in agreement that a new shelter facility is needed. The problem is finding funding, a funding stream to accomplish this goal. Last month, Mr. Stewart met with my associate and me and kindly offered to submit a proposal to Oregon Solutions for a needs assessment of animal services in Lane County. Mr. Mike Russell, manager with the Parks Department, is assisting in this process. It is our understanding that various stakeholder groups will have input on this needs assessment if it is accepted by Oregon Solutions as an appropriate project. We are hopeful that it will move forward. However, if it is not accepted, then we will need to identify other means for achieving a new public shelter on public land. Members of the community recently have been expressing support for a public shelter that we can be proud of, one where animals can experience reduced stress and show their best selves to potential adopters or while they wait to be reunited with their owners. Now is the time to start planning this project to make it a reality for our furry friends. We need a public shelter built on public land so that oversight remains in public hands. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Diane, before you start, I forgot to mention that we generally have a three minute limitation, but because we're so far ahead of schedule, uh, four or five minutes if you need it. Are you Diane? I'm Diane Bolte Silverman. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Um, my name is Diane Bolte Silverman. I live in Eugene, and I'm a longtime volunteer at LCAS, uh, now First Avenue Shelter. I spoke in support of building a new animal shelter at one of your past meetings, and I'm now strongly encouraging you to support building a separate public shelter for our abandoned mis and mistreated animals, as it appears that combining Green Hill Humane Society, a private shelter, with um, uh, creating a new public shelter for Lane County animals is being considered. A public shelter built on public land as opposed to a public shelter built on private land is necessary in order to avoid a conflict of interest between public and private management and to prevent uh, property conflicts arising when a pub public building is located on private property. The function of a private shelter where lost pets, vicious dogs, mistreated and abandoned animals are being held is very different than that of a private shelter where animals are handpicked for their so-called adoptability. Also, the site of a new public shelter should be in a location that's easily accessible to as many Lane County residents as possible, which is not the situation at the Green Hill location. I ask that you keep these points in mind when you hopefully approve and start planning the building of a new humane public shelter on public land. Thank you. Kit, help me with your last name. It's Duchin. Duchin, okay. Uh, I too am a long time uh, volunteer at I was uh, working at LCAS, or not working, volunteering at LCAS, and uh, now at the First Avenue Shelter, where the strays, the abandoned animals, the abused animals, that's where they go. Um, and I'm a person of few words, and I would like to reiterate what they said, but rather than do that, 
This is our mantra. And it says, dream it, plan it, build it. And it's time to stop talking about it and to make it a reality. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the committee this evening? Okay, then I will close the public hearing um, and go back to, uh, is there any committee process that I forgot to uh, bring up at the beginning that anybody would like to mention? Yes, sir. I would just like to mention that we have a first time budget committee member with us this evening that didn't get introduced. So uh, Dale, if um, welcome to the committee. I, understand you're the uh, appointment uh, commissioner Barr, so uh, I hope your first uh, meeting today wasn't uh, too hard. No, not at all. Welcome. Thank you. He, he had the unfortunate seating assignment between Pat and I who have been, is, how many hours, Commissioner Sorensen, have we been meeting in here today? <laughs> um, uh, Mr. And, and uh, Damon Parker from IS helped fix my computer at 8.30 this morning. So I have just gone over, what, <laughs> nine hours? No, 11 hours. Yeah, yeah. So, so Pat and I are both yawning, and poor, you know, poor Dale's having to try and resist yawning between the two of us. <laughs> and uh, he's done, done a pretty good job. Lots of coffee. I took my first phone call at 4.45 this morning, but it was a good one. <laughs> Just a, a fun fact, we often, Mr. Chair, we often talked about Lane County being the size of Connecticut. Uh, we're about four times the size of Rhode Island, about twice the size of uh, Delaware, and as big just about as uh, Hawaii, the island of Hawaii. So um, we can, you know, we talk about Connecticut a lot. Let's talk about Rhode Island, four times the size of Rhode Island. <laughs> and we don't get two senators. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> As long as we don't talk about median in incomes, I think we're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other banter or? <laughs> Can you tell we're getting punchy? No. Yes. <laughs> Christine, go ahead. Um, just to remind the committee, um, in front of you, you should see index cards, various colors, so that they will stand out. Um, those are in case you have questions that you were not able to ask, and they'll be on the table for each of the following meetings, um, the work sessions that you're going to have. And you should also have the agenda for the next meeting was passed out at the beginning um, of the meeting. And that meeting will be up in the BCC conference room in the afternoon um, rather than evening. Okay. And I think that's all we have for you tonight. You also had one um, question answered. You should have seen regarding FTE. There was one paper there, so that was the first question we'd received. Um, so we'll also hand out at each meeting any written responses uh, to questions that we have for you that are available at that time. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Then I will. I'm in place. Next meeting. Thank you. Thursday, 2 o'clock, BCC. She just announced it. Next.